the program. Hi, I'm Maggie, and I'm one of the reference librarians at the Troy Public Library. We want to thank the Friends of the Library tonight for supporting our program. I want to uh, welcome Maria tonight. Um, and Maria has done some other programs for us at, at the Troy Library. She did one on Budapest, Korea, and then also Germany, and very interesting. But tonight, it's tales of the Arabian Nights from ancient Amman to the deserts of Jordan. And um, I hope you enjoy this. And uh, Maria, go ahead and start your program. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, Maggie? Yes. Great. Well, thank you. Good evening to everyone. Thank you to the Troy Public Library for inviting me back yet again. I really appreciate it. This talk is in contrast to the other talks I've given, not about a place where I ever lived, but about a trip I took with my family in December of 2018. We flew on Christmas Day, December 25, 2018, to, um, to Amman, Jordan. It's a country I'd always wanted to visit for many reasons. And my cover shot is part of the um, archeological treasure, the number one tourist site in the country, uh, Petra which we also visited. So we are going to be looking today at the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. Hashemite comes from the word Hashem, which is the um, grandson of the prophet Muhammad, meaning that the royalty, the kings of Jordan are just direct descendants of Muhammad, putting them in a, in a special position compared to other rulers in the area. This is the country of Jordan that you see in front of you. It has rather a unique shape. I'd like to point out that the West Bank here was annexed by Jordan in 1948 when it gained its independence. It was not a British protectorate anymore and then became part of Jordan in 1950, or they occupied it in 48 and annexed it in 1950, but they lost it in a 1967 war with Israel. Uh, this war started over uh, arguments with uh, water rights. This is a very, very um, dry region, as you can tell. Uh, this is 75% uh, uh, is desert in Jordan. And so there were arguments about the, this lake up here where it's, uh, it's Kinneret, or we call it Lake Galilee, and also the Jordan River. So just briefly, what happened in 1967 was that these arguments escalated the Arab countries and Israel. And you can see the um, different Arab countries. These are the pan-Arab colors, uh, red, white, black, green, and sort of getting ready to advance on Israel. And the crowning, the crowning blow was way down here. Israel has a port, the Gulf of Eilat. Uh, there's also a Jordanian city here called Aqaba. And then down here, the Straits of Tehran, let the ships go out, and that was blockaded by Egypt. So Israel launched a preemptive strike on the 5th of June, 1967, and they were victorious. On the 10th of June, uh, 1967, they declared victory and the war was over. So um, Jordan, in effect, lost control of this area here, the West Bank, and basically became the home of the Palestine Liberation Organization until 1970, when there was a very bitter and sad civil war in Jordan, and then the PLO was evicted up to, up to Lebanon here. So, okay, so what do we know about Jordan? We know it's about the size of Ohio. It's 35,000 square miles. I mentioned that it's 75% desert. It doesn't have any natural oil reserves. It gets its oil from Saudi Arabia. It gets its gas from the Arab gas pipeline coming in uh, from Egypt. And so water is um, obviously that it is energy, energy poor. So the biggest, uh, the biggest obstacles for Jordan in its economy are scarcity of water, um, also the oil imports, and I don't, it goes without saying regional instability. If you read the papers and you know anything about the Middle East, they have been remarkably able to keep steady, a steady hand and uh, and uh, um, a, stable, a stable government through so many decades of turbulence for different reasons. Jordan, about 14% of its economy is from tourism. So that's a huge, huge amount. Uh, just now, of course, with everything in flux again all over the world with the Delta variant, but the economy is uh, getting up and going. So we were flying to Amman, Jordan 
And um, this was one of the reasons, there were many reasons why I wanted to visit Jordan. I had been in Israel in 1976 for a month and at that time wasn't able to cross over into this country and so was always curious about it. Then I read this book. On the left, you see a picture of King Hussein, who was the uh, leader of Jordan, who had four wives and his fourth wife was an American from the state of New Jersey. She was born into a very wealthy, privileged family. Her father was of Middle Eastern descent and her name was Lisa Hallaby. And her father at one time led Pan American and then he was also involved with the FAA. And Hussein was a very avid aviation fan and skilled pilot. And she came, her father was doing work in Jordan and long story short, they met and they had a very fast romance, literally just, um, just less than two or three months. And she, he asked her to marry him and she said yes. And so the book, you can't see the, the subtitle here, but um, it's a, a leap of faith. She took a leap of faith in marrying this man, A being his fourth wife, being in another country across the world. C, uh, just, just uh, he at that time had a reputation as being a very eligible bachelor but the marriage succeeded. They married in 78 and he passed away sadly in um, 1999 of cancer. So she took the name Noor, meaning light, Queen Noor. So this is a fascinating book and that propelled me also to want to, uh, to, want to visit Jordan. Uh, so here, we, here is our Royal Jordanian Airlines. Um, they do fly out of Detroit. That flight would stop in Montreal on the way to Amman. So we were five people, my husband and I, and three adult children, and two of them are on the East Coast. And from New York City, it would have been just a direct flight to Amman. So we all met in New York City, and we also flew on Christmas Day, and we've done that a couple of times now because Christmas Day rates are cheaper. So we were getting onto the Royal Jordanian flight in New York City on Christmas Day in 2018. And we were greeted by this flag when we landed at the airport. I had mentioned that King Hussein had four wives. His third wife, um, Aliyah, was tragically killed in a helicopter crash. She had been visiting a hospital and uh, there was an accident on the way back to Amman. And so the international airport is named for her. And when I showed you that map of the Arab countries around Israel, I mentioned the pan-Arab colors. So the black, white, and green are pan-Arab colors and red stands for the Hashemite uh, dynasty. And then uh, the star stands for, um, it's a seven pointed star and it stands for the um, verses of the, um, of the Quran and the and the principles of the Quran uh, to which um, the religion would adhere. So this was greeting us at the airport. And then you can tell right away by the arrivals board that you're in a country that is, you know, just completely different from where you normally travel. There were three names I had to look up. I had to look up um, Sharia right here. Sharia is uh, in the UAE and, and Sabia is in uh, Turkey. And um, I also didn't know, um, Asiu, which is in Egypt. So this was our arrival in Amman. Um, because Jordan had been a British protectorate, English is very prevalent. Uh, we didn't, uh, I have to say right now at the beginning of the talk, have any trouble at all during the whole trip with communication. And almost everything that we did had been booked right from um, our home here in, uh, in Dearborn, Michigan. Um, so you'll see a lot of pictures in uh, Jordan of these three uh, gentlemen, members of the royal family, or sometimes you'll only see the current, the middle picture, the current King Abdullah. So this would be King Hussein, who uh, reigned until 1999, his son Abdullah, and then his, his the crown prince, who will be the heir. And uh, just, we're not going to read through all of this, but very quickly, this is King Hussein. So Jordan is a constitutional monarchy and the king can exercise his power through the government. He also has um, control over parliament. He can approve legislation and he can dissolve parliament. Hussein was very beloved, very respected worldwide for leading his country through a couple of wars with Israel, for just navigating the wars of that, that just the waters of that turbulent region. He was seen as a peacemaker. He was very popular. He was also, I've said he was a pilot. He collected vintage automobiles and he was a ham operator. And Queen Noor, or Lisa Hallaby, was his fourth wife. He had three children by her, and uh, altogether he fathered 11 children. 
and this would have been his funeral. It was attended by leaders from all over the world. This is his son, Abdullah, who would then uh, be king. For instance, this is our former President Clinton and behind him, former President Carter, uh, Prince Charles over here, Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands. So very much paying respect to this beloved, beloved monarch. He was 63 when he died. If he hadn't had that cancer or been able to conquer it, you know, he would have obviously been on the throne much longer. The current King Abdullah was born in 62. His wife is originally a Palestinian and they have actually four children. And he also had the job of this Arab Spring, which we saw that has left so many different legacies in uh, Egypt or Tunisia or this, this devastatingly sad ongoing conflict in Syria. He has navigated his country through that, um, allowing uh, some more um, uh, liberties and so, so meeting the people halfway in this uh, very, very important task of keeping, keeping the country um, stable. He's also had um, uh, about 1.4 million Syrian refugees uh, come into his country uh, because, because of that, that conflict. So he's, he's maintained the stability and um, he promotes interfaith dialogue and a moderate understanding of Islam. And interestingly enough, even though uh, Jordan does not have the West Bank anymore, he is um, the custodian of the Muslim and the Christian sacred rights in, uh, in Jerusalem. And then his son, who will also someday be on the throne, Crown Prince Hussein, born in 94, so he would be, um, well, he's in his late 20s. He's a Georgetown University grad, and he's already uh, working his way through the ranks and learning what it will take uh, someday, um, hopefully not for a long time, uh, to be the king. So just very briefly, and then we're going into the pictures. I don't want you to think this is just a history and geography lesson, but you should know that the entire region was under Ottoman control. And then there was a revolt in 1918. It was called the Great Arab Revolt. And the countries really thought they were going to have their own uh, say in the area, but the British and the French secretly negotiated a, an agreement and they divided the Arab lands into spheres of influence. So for instance, Syria had a French protectorate, Jordan was a British protectorate. And then um, in 1921, the son of Sharif Hussein in Saudi Arabia came up and established uh, the Emirate of Transjordan. And again, it was a British protectorate until 1946 and then became the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan in 1948. So a relatively, a relatively young country. And if you look at the shape, you've got, for instance, the, well, thankfully, thankfully, when the borders with uh, Saudi Arabia were drawn in 19, 25, uh, Jordan was given this, this port, Aqaba, so that it would not be completely landlocked. And there are nine straight lines here determining the uh, border with Saudi Arabia. And I'm not quite sure how this was uh, developed or formed, but this was known at the time as Churchill's Sneeze, Winston Churchill's Sneeze. However, in this later map, Churchill's Sneeze has disappeared. So I'm not really sure what happened to that. But anyway, and then this Iraq-Syria um, border here was also established through various treaties in the 19, um, in the 19, uh, 1920s. So again, massive, massive deserts here, very little water, uh, some, some mountain, a uh, little bit of mountain. Uh, um, yeah, present, present, present day Jordan. And uh, so what we did was we landed in Amman right here, the capital. And we were in Amman for three days. We did take a one day trip to, uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, on the on the West Bank, and then we went down all the way to right about here in the desert to a to a place called Wadi Rum, and we from there we went over to Petra to see the archaeological site. We did not visit um, Aqaba on our trip, and then we asked if we could. So when we came down, it was a straight shot, but we came back and came back along the shore of the Dead Sea just for some different scenery and to learn a little bit more and back back to Amman. So here we are in Amman. We booked an Airbnb. It should have been no surprise that we found out the owner had a cousin two hours north of Detroit. 
Uh, obviously, our area here in Southeast Michigan is very rich in Middle Eastern immigration. And this city, Amman, dates back uh, 4 million years, set back to 7,000 BC. It, um, at the time of the Greeks and the Romans, it was actually called Philadelphia. We were really surprised to find out because of the Greek ruler, Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who named it after himself. And then in the 13th century, the Ammonites gave it um, the name Rabat Amman, meaning the capital, and it just became Amman over time. So we are looking out of the window of our Airbnb and there are hills in Amman and we had a great view just in a great, um, a great spread, a great spread in front of us. And um, you should know that as old as Amman is, it also has uh, also some uh, a very modern aspect to it. And because of the stability, it's probably along with Dubai and Doha, Doha being the capital of Qatar, one of the favorite preferred places for headquarters in the Middle East for uh, companies. So you've got a glimpse of the old and the new here, and you'll see that juxtaposition a lot in, in the city. And so we wandered down to Rainbow Street. Uh, the signs were bilingual in the Arabic script and English. And we went to a restaurant that was very casual, but had delicious food, which we would find in so many restaurants around us here. And also if the king has been a visitor in that establishment, be it a restaurant or a bakery, who knows where, there's usually a picture of the king on the wall. Um, the monarchy is, is uh, revered, but it is also not permitted in Jordan to criticize the king if that would lead to, uh, to problems. So again, they really want to keep the stability. And so this would have been King Abdullah when he was much younger with Queen Rania and with his um, older son. And so we are having uh, a meal on the left that you'll recognize with the, the hummus and the baba ganoush and, and the, the um, the uh, um, falafel and the pita bread. And then on the right, so pretty much the same in this instance, but might've been uh, some lamb there. And also the dishes are looking a little bit ornate, but we didn't have a bad meal uh, during the entire time that we're there. And if you're a vegetarian, it's really easy to still get your daily protein from all those chickpeas. So that was a plus for our family. So we started walking the next day. And of course the mosques are, very prevalent. Um, the um, the um, most of the Jordanians are Muslim, um, Sunni versus Shia. The difference having to do with a discrepancy about the inheritance after the death of the Prophet Muhammad and the line of succession. But um, there are some Christians living in Amman or in the Jordan Valley. But the state religion is Islam, and the king must be Muslim. And just um, uh, just sort of FYI, uh, most of the Muslims in the world are, uh, are Sunni and um, uh, in, in the majority of the countries, but they do have, for instance, Iraq, Iran, Bahrain, that uh, where the, um, where the, the Sunnis are, uh, the Shiites, the Shiites are the majority. So we're walking down the street and we're taking in the sites. And for instance, we've got one store there. It looks like it has some items just about as old as the city. And then there's another store with, uh, with some fancy dance garb and, and, uh, and a pastry shop with those famous, uh, famous Middle Eastern sweets or um, a mini market, or here's the bread factory, always fresh. Again, the bilingual making it so easy. So we decided to go see some of the Roman ruins first. And the first one we came to was gated. We couldn't walk into it, but we could read the signs. And it was a, um, a Roman public fountain from the second century. And so we could see a little bit of what had been unearthed. And there are always a lot of signs around telling you and informing you. So if you forget your guidebook, you're still, you're still actually okay. And we can see that our country has uh, been pumping money, uh, the sign on the right, into the, um, some of the archeological excavation efforts. And then the second one we came to was, well, this is the Hashemite Plaza in the middle, um, named for the dynasty, which was built around 2014. We're going to be going up to this hilltop site called the Citadel, but opposite the hilltop site is a Roman Colosseum. And in so many capitals or large cities around the world now, there you'll see these big letters. And so, you know, you can stand between the letters or you can put your hand around the heart and have your picture taken. And uh, um, so no, Amman also has that. But we're going back here to this Colosseum, this amphitheater or this Colosseum that was built in the second, cent second century. 
And we know from the Colosseum in Rome that they were very popular in the Roman world, these open air theaters, this particular one built to honor the emperor Antonius Pius. This is a different angle here that you can see. And then this one I didn't take, but this is interesting because you can see, well, it's got just a great vantage point. And it, so it was built facing north, so the spectators would not be looking into the sun. And it's very, very steeply raked so that even at the top level, you could clearly hear what was being said. It's used today for things such as the prize giving when they have the Amman Marathon. There's a book fair that takes place there. There are some musical concerts. I was surprised that it is so um, accessible to the public. We could literally um, walk all over these steps and climb everywhere. I could imagine maybe at some point that might be limited to when it's not being used for you know, public events, just because the wear and tear on the stone. But, um, but so we very much enjoyed that and just, um, well, just the entire atmosphere and thinking back to the second century BC when the Romans were there. And then at the base of the, uh, of the um, amphitheater, there are two smaller museums on each side. Um, this is announcing when it was built uh, here, 138 to 161 AD. And we chose to take a look at the Museum of Popular Traditions. This is the very revered and age old headdress, which uh, started out in the desert from the patrols, keeping cool at night and um, uh, keeping cool during the day and warm at night. The, the kufia, I always hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly. We'll see that again later on. And so we went into that museum and then it has such things as uh, mosaic from the Roman time or um, uh, ethnic costumes from different parts of the country or a statue from uh, Greek or Roman times. And then uh, right uh, near the Colosseum, um, you know, a hotel and then the lunch and this just a beautiful, beautiful, very uh, picturesque pastry shop. These are some columns right outside the Colosseum. So directly across from that then up on that hillside I was pointing to is the Citadel, which is built on Amman's highest point. And this has also withstood so many like bronze, iron, Roman, Byzantine ages, just layer upon layer of history. And on the right, you can see from the Citadel looking down on that uh, amphitheater where we just were. So we went up to the Citadel and again, um, talking about different points of time in history when it was, when the town was called Philadelphia and then Amman and giving a very, a uh, very good overview timeline to follow, um, just always laid out for you so, so well. Uh, so two things on top of the Citadel, this is the Temple of Hercules. You don't see much of it anymore. In fact, there is a question as to whether or not it was ever finished, but from the layout of the temple, um, it is believed to have been absolutely massive or planned to be absolutely massive. Just the perimeter here is 100 by 80 feet, but the outer perimeter there is about 300 to 400 feet. So on the right here is a depiction of what scholars believe that it might have looked like, or maybe this was the plan and it was never finished because it, it succumbed to one of the, the area's frequent earthquakes. And the other thing right at it is uh, the remains, are, are the remains of a colossal statue, which it is assumed was Hercules himself just because of his size and his strength. And he would have stood almost 40 feet tall. And the only thing, the only thing left are, um, are fingers. So one, one hand, and, and there's always a joke about how well manicured the nails look. And then this is part of an elbow joint. So again, the earthquake, who knows, mysteries that will never quite come together, but um, a tribute to Hercules. And then one of the jokes that I read about was, well, obviously, the rest of the marble found its way to the countertops in the wealthier houses in Amman. Who knows? So that's up there on the Citadel. And then the other uh, point of interest is the um, the Umyads. The Umyads were one of the caliphates established after the death of Muhammad. 
and the Umayyads have several desert palaces, but this one happens to be right up on the citadel. And it was a series of residential uh, residence and palaces up on top here. And this is all that's left. This is particularly famous here, this, um, this audience chamber, which has a beautiful, beautiful dome, which was um, replaced with wood um, sometime in the last 10, 15 years, just because it is used for receptions now and other reasons. And it would have been a, um, it would have been a receiving place where the ruler would have received his armies or other dignitaries. Interestingly enough about this one, it's different from the other, uh, the other desert palaces because it's built on the foundations of a Byzantine church. So it, um, it is, it faces, it's still, it's still uh, the, the religious part still faces uh, Mecca, but it is not, um, not uh, say the church, there's a, it, you know, it's at uh, perpendicular just because of the base. So this is the Umayyad palace that you have to see if you're up there. And then this is again, you know, showing the old with the new, uh, the citadel with, with modern Amman, and then just some of the ruins of the stones that you would see up there. And uh, uh, this is all up to on top of, of the citadel. So again, um, the old of the new. And just back here, I just wanna point out in the distance here, this flag, this flag is the Ragadan flag, and it's on the grounds of one of the palaces in Amman, the Ragadan Palace, and is a massive flag measuring 200 by 100 uh, feet, and um, is a source of pride and a landmark. You can see it from 20 kilometers away, but because of the fact that when there are high winds, it makes so much noise, it's not flown at that time. It's just too dangerous and too, too noisy. So that would be the Ragadan flag. So we left those, uh, those attractions and then we went to see the Jordan Museum, which um, is an assembly of the finest of the country's history and cultural heritage. There was also a, a special exhibit at that time about inventions, um, so much to look in there. The, the number one attraction I would say in this museum, oh, well, first of all, we'll go back to the Kufya again that I had mentioned previously. And um, again, this was introduced as part of the Desert Forces uniform. And so if you even see the king wearing it, uh, it's not, you know, why is he wearing that? It's always because it's part of the national, sort of a national costume. And the size here, it says the size of the tassels will show off the scarf's value and the owner's status. And this is a picture of King Abdullah wearing that headdress. But the number one attraction would definitely be the Dead Sea Scrolls, which have just always over history um, been a source of fascination and which were first found in 1974 in a cave in Qumran here, supposedly as the story goes by a shepherd looking for a lost sheep. And these scrolls, detail life in the first and second century. Part of them are um, biblical texts and part of them about, are about secular life. And they are written on papyrus or on animal skin. And there's quite a collection of them. And this uh, particular museum has, um, has a good share of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But there's one called the Copper Scroll that is not like the others which is just as I just said, written on copper. And it lists 64 places where supposedly buried treasure is located. And it's been the impetus for treasure hunts all throughout history. But there's supposed to be 4,600 pieces of precious metal listed on this scroll, making the haul over 1 billion. But um, I have to read, um, the, the clues are very, um, very obscure. So you don't really know where to start. So for instance, in the salt pit that is under the steps, 41 talents of silver. Or in the cave of the old washer's chamber on the third terrace, 65 ingots of gold. But there's never a starting point given. So it's really hard to uh, imagine how you're really ever going to find this treasure, but always a source of fascination. And still in the news in 2017, um, the BBC reported a team of Israeli archaeologists who in a cave found um, what evidenced uh, not scrolls anymore, which were probably taken out long before then, but jars and wrappings for the scrolls. And uh, so that, of course, is studied very intensely. And then this is really interesting. Just this year, I found an article in Harper's Magazine 
about the a Green family, which owns a series of Hobby Lobby stores, and they purchased what they thought were Dead Sea Scrolls, and they had opened a Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., I think in 2017. So they had these scrolls on display, but then upon closer examination, there was a lot of skepticism. The, the content also the way when they, when they brought in an art forgery company, the way that the, the writing was, and, it, and anyway, long story short, they're not authentic Dead Sea Scrolls. So someone went to a great deal of trouble to uh, forge these and to make a lot of money from it. Not sure if they ever really got to the bottom of that. So just a fascinating topic because there's a lot of mystery around it, but Jordan is very proud of what is in, in the museum. And then we went to see this automobile museum. Um, I was really the one who wanted to go. And so we were one hour in dense uh, traffic jam. Traffic, we were, uh, we were six people, including the taxi driver in a taxi made for five. So one person had to be across the laps of the other. And they said, oh, do you really think this is going to be worth it? And, and uh, we got there and it was dark and we thought it was closed, but it wasn't. We were in luck. And this was just absolutely fascinating because this goes back to 1916 to the to the to the cars that the royalty um, uh, well collected and King Hussein was also an avid collector and so just gorgeous specimens and here you have for instance this car um, in front of uh, the treasury at Petro which we'll be talking about this would indicate that it is the you know a member of the royal family. Uh, in this car. And uh, then for instance, this one, I think he has the Union Jack on it. So maybe when uh, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip came to visit, that car would have been used to drive them around. So just absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. And, and then this was also there, the King also loved motorcycles. So here he is with Queen Noor out in the the desert, which you'll see in a little bit. And it says Royal Trailblazer, uh, Jordan Hussein opens his spectacular kingdom. So they had this cover of the Condé Nast Traveler on display. So on the very far right, the movie The Martian with Matt Damon was filmed in Wadi Rum in the desert. And at the end of the uh, filming, the crew gifted the, the, the rover to the country of Jordan just because they had shown such hospitality during the filming. So that's on display outside the museum. And then last of all, uh, this is a 1947 uh, Dove de Havilland. It's a very special plane because, so the first ruler of when Transjordan was established in the 20s was uh, actually the uncle of King Hussein. Um, sadly enough, uh, or it was his grandfather. It was his grandfather because his father was deemed uh, unfit mentally uh, to rule. It was um, a very sad uh, diagnosis. So Hussein, the grandson of the ruler on the throne was flying with his grandfather to Jerusalem for Friday prayers at a mosque and the grandfather was assassinated. So he became king at a very young age and but the, the pilot of this plane had to fly this grief-stricken young prince back to Amman, and the pilot was a man named Jack Dalgleish. He was a Scotsman, and so just to divert the prince from his grief, he brought him up into the cockpit and showed him the controls and, you know, just to take his mind off of what had just happened, if that was even possible. And uh, so uh, Jack Dalgleish became a, a lifelong friend, and uh, and King Hussein became a lo an um, avid um uh, pilot, a uh, very skilled pilot. There's one story about when he and Mr. Dalglish were in uh, in another plane and they had the royal emblem emblazed on the tail and two uh, MiG jets were following them and demanded that they land. And uh, they they said, no, they refused to land. And so uh, Hussein turned the controls over to Dalglish who was very skilled and he got them across the Jordanian border and landed safely in the desert. And so Hussein escaped yet another, there were a lot of assassination attempts during the course of his lifetime. So anyway, this was always his favorite plane. And so this is also on display outside the, outside the museum. So that is what we more or less saw in Amman. And we had three very rich days. We did not go up to Jarash just for one minute. It's only about an hour away, but you can't see everything. It's another splendid example of a Greco-Roman city with uh, preserved Roman theaters and sometimes called the Pompeii of the East and remarkably uh, good, 
good condition still. I mean, you can always see some stone remains from the ruins, but uh, so this is Jarash. But what we did do was, um, I think I told you, we took a one day trip to, uh, to Jerusalem. And so on the way, we stopped at the baptism site where uh, Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. And these, uh, both the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church agree that this was definitely the site where John the Baptist was with, um, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Bethany beyond the Jordan, it became a, a World Heritage uh, Site in 2005. And you can visit it, it's free, you can walk all around it. Um, you can also be baptized there if you want, wish, but there is, if you uh, rent, the robes, uh, there is a rental fee for the robes. So this area was very heavily mined after the 1967 war, but in the 90s, Jordan and Israel had a peace pact and at the request of the Jordanian royalty, they uh, demined this area and so it's um, easily accessible. Every now and then there's some comment from Israel about how they believe that the site is really on the other side of the Jordan River, but it is on the Jordanian side. So this was a brief stop at Bethany beyond the Jordan. And so here we are in Amman, and this is our day outing to Jerusalem over here, which could take up a, an entire presentation. So I'm gonna make it real short, but this is where we crossed. Uh, this is on the left, what the bridge would have looked like uh, over the Jordan after the 1967 war. It is known as the um, Allenby Bridge, or in Jordan, it's known as the King Hussein uh, border crossing. So it's pretty easy. You just have to have a lot of time because you go through the Jordanian checkpoint and then the Israeli checkpoint takes a lot longer and they charge $50 a person uh, to get in, but it's basically paperwork. So you should have a good book with you. And then you, um, and then you're, then you're through your, you're, uh, you're in the West Bank and we were on our way to Jerusalem. We did not visit Masada, which is the World Heritage Site where the um, Jewish people uh, held out on top and then uh, took their own lives in order not to fall into the hands of the Romans at the foot waiting for them. Beautiful vistas out over the Dead Sea. We did not um, go to Bethlehem. There is a church in Bethlehem and there's a grotto downstairs and a silver star, which is said to be the birthplace of Jesus Christ. I had been there in 1976 and we had again a limited amount of time. So we concentrated on the old city of Jerusalem here. And just for instance, the Wailing Wall the, or the Western Wall sacred to the Jewish people as part of the um, second, second temple, the doorway through which we entered, then the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, the two most holiest sites in Christianity where uh, Christ was, um, uh, um, where he was uh, died on the cross, crucified, and then where he rose again, and then the um, and then the uh, uh, absolutely gorgeous Dome of the Rock, which is the the uh, the most recognizable landmark in Islam in in Jerusalem, and uh, which is the um, uh, earliest archaeological attested uh, religious structure to be built by a Muslim ruler. So we did not enter that; it was closed, but we could walk around. And then you've got your usual array of souvenirs uh, from magnets to um, scarves to lots of obviously lots of camels all the time and dried fruit. So that was our one day in Jerusalem. And then now we're headed down south to this. We're, we're at the edge of the Arabian desert. We It took probably about mm, three, three and a half hours on a very, very modern highway to slice straight down through the country from Amman. And another title for Wadi Rum is the Valley of the Moon. And it is just an incredible landscape here. The uh, movie, Lawrence of Arabia, which talks about the great Arab revolt, you'll see in just a moment, uh, was filmed here. And Wadi Rum has uh, almost all, it's, it, it's a favorite place to be studied by geologists because it has almost all the minerals in the world present. This reddish is from iron oxide. And so you get these, uh, these uh, um, skies that are just star studded and there's these vast, this vast desert space about the size of New York City. And uh, it's very, very much a, a fairy tale uh, um, 
atmosphere at night. So our van took us there here, you know, the younger generation over on the right, there was a Wi-Fi code in the van, everybody was happy. And this is the visitor center where our van let us off. And then we climbed into this, we had reserved um, a tent in one of the Bedouin uh, tourist um, enclaves that, that I'll be showing you. And again, all that was done uh, from, from here and very, very easy to do. So we are now in our, our Jeep and here is the visitor center and we're leaving, we're leaving the visitor center now. We're uh, forging on into the desert and we're just have this, this uh, stunning, these, these massive rocks around us and uh, making tracks with the Jeep. And then this is the movie Lawrence of Arabia where um, T.E. Lawrence, who uh, was British, who knew a lot about the ways of the Arab tribes was sent down there to, uh, to link up with them and to overcome the Ottoman Turks, which it was successful. Uh, the Ottoman Turks were no longer rulers after that, but they also went down to Aqaba and retook a fortress. So this was filmed with uh, Omar Sharif and um, Peter O'Toole and uh, Omar Sharif, Peter O'Toole, and I'm missing one more famous actor. But anyway, you can just imagine this Hollywood crew there in 1962 filming this blockbuster with this gorgeous scenery all around. And uh, this is sort of a, uh, I didn't take this picture, but again, these, this is what you see. And this is, uh, um, this is very striking. So here is our camp, everybody, uh, every, you know, if this you get one of these little huts here, and it is a goat hair hut. is a It is a Bedouin hut. The desert doesn't really have any any uh, structures, any buildings. I mean, they have the visitor center, or you'll see some Bedouin tents, but or maybe a building for the desert patrol, but not really any any other infrastructure. And the Bedouins, being the traditional desert dwellers, although many many of them have moved to the city now, and uh, it's a little bit different. But traditionally in history, they would be there for pe perhaps pilgrims crossing through the desert, um, showing them where the water wells were, things like that. Uh, that's all changed a bit, but they do uh, provide a great deal of hospitality in these tents. And then there's always somebody with a camel waiting to earn you know, a couple of pennies by having a picture taken. So we each had one of these tents, and then this would have been the uh, sort of like in a youth hostel when you get together for meals, uh, breakfast and dinner were buffets that were here. And this is really what it looked like. Um, obviously, it was December. It, boy, I'll tell you, when the sun went down, it was cold in the desert at night. And so at night, these side flaps would be rolled down. And then you see, uh, you see this oven here. And then there was always uh, tea or coffee available, but you can air it out during during the day. And it's very or ornate. So the youth hostel atmosphere, everybody exchanging stories. Where have you been? What have you seen? Where are you going next? It was a very lively atmosphere and a mix of, of nationalities. We actually met a lot of Italians on this trip. They told us that there was some super saver from Rome to Amman. And uh, but but again, there were others uh, also there as well. These are our hosts cooking uh, dinner. They called it a Bedouin microwave. They would put this, this structure down into the ground. It would be chicken, potatoes, and carrots, but the buffet would have all, also all the things that you saw that I showed you back in Amman with the traditional Middle Eastern specialties. And then they would put this out in the tent for everyone uh, and so we could serve ourselves. So these are two of my daughters. Again, it got cold at night. They're snuggling up to that, uh, that oven, that fire, and just getting the warmth before we went out to our own tent. And um, so here is our tent. So everybody would take their shoes off because you don't want sand all over the inside. And it was literally just, in our case, five beds. So this is actually a person in this bed. So these beds had very, very heavy blankets piled on them. And then there's another person back here. And then there are three more beds. So that was it. There's not room for any other furniture and you're just all in there. Um, the blankets were really, really warm, but it was cold. And um, this was our bath facility for everybody, men and women together. There were, uh, so there were two sinks here and the water came out in a tiny little dribble uh, from these sinks. And one sign said, save water, save the earth. And then the other sign said, uh, you are in the desert, conserve water, 
So, and then there were some um, toilet stalls over here and there was one stall with a hose where I guess you could take a shower from this hose, but the water was cold, it was December. So I didn't even get undressed for the, for the three days that we were there. And so, and I don't know how many other people did, but I just crawled underneath those blankets at night and I was snug as a bug, but I just didn't feel like going under that cold hose. So I considered myself fortunate to be able to brush my teeth, floss and blush, brush my teeth from that trickle of water. And so you have to be adventurous. If you want the four star Hilton, you're probably not going to be happy sleeping in this desert enclave for three nights. But if you're up for adventure, you'll do all, you'll, you know, you'll do okay. And then during the day, these are the, um, the Bedouins with their Jeeps and they would be ferrying the tourists all over the place. And so we would see a mushroom shaped rock or there would be a structure where, um, where the brave can cross over the top. Um, here is one Jeep that happens to have people sitting up on top. Here are our hosts uh, preparing a picnic for us in the middle of the day. I should mention that there are also no bathroom facilities out in the desert. So you just literally, um, you know, you find a rock and disappear behind it. But again, you have to have that little bit of adventure. So this is what we did for those couple of days that we were there. We rode around, we saw some hieroglyphics. We, uh, some people went sort of into this, uh, this crevice here. And back here is a, um, is a sand dune you could slide down if you wanted to. Some people went all the way up to the top of this structure and uh, just, uh, just again, gorgeous scenery and also that little baby camel uh, running around for a photo op. So this is Wadi Rum. We spent three nights there and here we are, we're all um, Wadi Rummed out, but we had uh, just this gorgeous, gorgeous desert panorama around us for three days and we're, uh, this is the Jeep bringing us back to the visitor center. And this is a tribute to Matt Damon uh, making the movie The Martian with that, uh, with that setting in 2016. So after Wadi Rum, we were driving. The landscape is predictably very arid. Uh, Smithsonian Magazine says cracked and sandy, seared and unpromising. And we're heading for Petra now, which uh, was one of my original reasons for wanting to go to Jordan. And um, the nearest town to Petra, actually, if you walk from Wadi Musa to Petra, it's literally 15 or 20 minutes, depending on where your hotel is. So this is the nearest town to the site. And we arrived at our hotel here, which was very modern and nobody's mind was on Petra. I can tell you right now when we got there, what do you think we were thinking about? We were thinking about a hot shower. So that was the number one priority at this hotel. And everybody had a hot shower. There was plenty of hot water to go around. And then there was that fabulous buffet. So we happened to be there on New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve is not, not celebrated in the country of Jordan. I have Lebanese friends who say that they do celebrate it in Lebanon, but it is not in Jordan. So we found an Irish pub over here on the right. And there's, it says Petra beer. Um, which was full of foreigners having a good time from all over the world. And then the next day was New Year's Day, but no, 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 you don't wanna think that people are going to sleep in late because if you only have maybe one day for Petra, you wanna get there early. So Petra also has these letters in this heart that you can stand and pose with and take a picture and welcome to Petra. And here everybody is heading towards the, the entrance of this very, very famous site. Um, so Petra became about because of the Nabataeans. And this is moving forward in time to when they had already been conquered by the Roman Empire. But basically they were skilled, they were, they were desert nomads and they became skilled traders. And their their kingdom, and I just took this picture of the Roman Empire because it's always fascinating to marvel over and over again how large the Roman Empire was. But, uh, and they named uh, um, Petra Arabia Petrea. But so Petra would have been right here. So it would have had the whole uh, Sinai Peninsula there and would have extended up and, um, uh, and Nabatea actually, where the Nabataeans were. And Petra was their, was their capital city. And so this is a great map because here is Petra, here was their capital. And they traded with the Far East, with China, with India, 
up and through the Mediterranean, Greece, Italy, Egypt, and they became very, very wealthy. They were very skilled in harvesting rainwater, which was crucial for survival, also for agriculture, and also for stone carving, which you'll see examples of. And you saw at the very beginning at the opening slide, but how they really amassed their, their wealth was in the trading of incense. So the incense was coming up in the form of frankincense and myrrh from down here, present day Yemen, and, um, after the Menaean kingdom collapsed in about the second century BC, uh, the, the Nabataeans took over and they became the middlemen for the trade. And incense was very important because with the rise of the, um, the Greeks, the Romans and the Egyptians, this was a very, very valuable commodity. They used it for embalming, they burned it, they used it at funerals. It was very expensive because of the route that it had to travel to get to them. And they were wealthy, these civilizations, and they were, they were willing to pay. So the Nabataeans would have uh, stops set up and would um, have payment at these stops from, you know, like a tax that you had to pay when you were passing. And they grew rich. They grew rich off of the incense. And this um, is sort of a romantic depiction. These, cam these massive camel trains moving from the southern part of Arabia uh, up, uh, you know, up to Amman would take about, not Amman, but where Petra was the headquartered, would take about 11 weeks to get there. And always, you know, the, the length traveled, it always depends upon where water was in the desert. And so it must have just been fascinating to watch these beasts. Um, the left is an authentic picture from that time. The right I just took from a modern tourist magazine, but you get the picture, right, of, of the camels moving through. So the Nabataeans did pretty well for themselves, and Petra, what we're going to see now, was their capital city. And on any given day, you would have had 20 to 30,000 people passing through this city, traders or travelers. So here we are back at the entry gate here, and we are going to walk through this road to a very narrow uh, gorge and then see some sights along here. And if you're very adventurous and have a lot of energy in one day, you can go all the way up here to see the picture you saw at the beginning of my show. So we're coming in at the entry and you, are, um, you can walk and most, of, most people walk. You could also pay to ride on a horse you could pay to ride in uh, one of these little uh, carts. Um, you could pay for a short way uh, uh, to be on a burro or a donkey, or um, you could uh, sit on a camel. I don't think the camels take you for a long time, but it's a very picturesque and very popular photo motif. And so we are approaching what is known as the Sikh, which is a very narrow gorge and which was a fault that happened throughout history. Again, the signs are, are bilingual, so they're easy to follow. And the Sikh has stones that depending on the time of day and that depending on how the sun is shining, artistically we'll say it's like a palette and a mixture of pinks and golds and browns. And, and uh, um, again, just how you're standing. This would have been um, a betel, so maybe a religious offering there coming through. And what you can also see are um, here, you can see because the Nabataeans had harvested that rainwater. So they have these troughs running along there. So the seek is very, very narrow. Look at this in some, in some places, but it always, these little carts can always fit through. So you're traveling through um, the seek, which is almost a mile long, not quite. And you can imagine being a, well, you can imagine being a tourist or being a, a stranger or a tradesperson coming through and then surfacing out onto this. And this back here that you're going to see in just a minute is really, and Petra is also known as the Rose City just because of the color of the stone. And then you come out onto this, all these different shrines and temples, this being the most majestic and the most iconic picture of Petra called the treasury. It wasn't really a treasury at all. It was a mausoleum believed to be um, the mausoleum of King Aratus IV, but it's 130 feet tall and it's built, remember I had said they were skilled in stone carving. So it was built into the rock. 
which probably accounts for why it still survived uh, over the centuries um, and survived earthquakes, which around 400 AD would um, lead to the total downfall of Petra after the Romans and the, the Byzantines had taken it over. So this is the treasury. It's absolutely stunning when you're standing in front of it. Um, the, it's decorated with symbols for the, for the afterlife. And uh, for instance, you have Castor and Pollux right here, the two, um, the two gods who um, heavily twins who spent part of their time on Olympus and part in the underworld. And here they're guiding the, uh, the souls of the heroes to the Elysian field. You have Isis up here, who's the goddess of love and immortality. You have um, a frieze at the top here. You have winged eagles carrying souls away. So there are some bullet holes up here because of the myth of it having been a treasury was perpetrated through ages and maybe people thought that they could find something, but um, you don't go in, it's roped off. Um, obviously archeologists go in and there are three big rooms inside which were probably funerary chambers, but there's enough going on outside. And I was reading where now during this year where tourism couldn't happen because of COVID, there was some um, out here where normally the tourist masses are, there was a lot of uh, um, further excavation, further digging, a lot of high tech uh, surveying in instruments also uh, uh, mapping Petra. And uh, so there's a lot going on. Um, this is one scene as we stood there looking um, at this gorgeous uh, monument. And then there would be a souvenir shop and there would be your, um, your bilingual sign. And um, so literally, well, you have a lot to see, but you could stand there for hours just watching. People watching is always so fascinating anywhere in the world. So this is the treasury. And we weren't, on the two nights that we were in Petra, um, um, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, they didn't do this, but there is an extra that you can uh, um, attend called Petra by Night. This is in front of the treasury where they have luminaries and they have music. So we didn't see that, but we heard about that. Uh, also, um, I mentioned uh, Lawrence of Arabia and I mentioned the Martian. Well, so in um, about 1987-88, uh, Queen Noor and King Hussein were in uh, London and they were, um, uh, this movie was being filmed. They met Steven Spielberg and Harrison Ford and Queen Noor had the idea of inviting them to come to Jordan to maybe film part of the, part of the movie you know, obviously uh, for, for cultural uh, goodwill between countries, also good for the economy of Jordan. So in the last scene of this um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusader, they burst out of the Sikh and into the treasury to go find the Holy Grail. So very appropriate, they're bursting into the treasury. So this was filmed there in 19, 1989. Um, so this is a, David Roberts was a British artist who traveled there and painted many beautiful watercolor paintings. He's got just a lovely postcard here showing the treasury. And this is our son, you can, I didn't choose to do this, but you can climb, I don't know how many steps up and get this photo op on a carpet with Petra down there behind you. That was a little too high for, for Maria. Um, so I, I chose not to, but he and, um, one of our daughters went up there. So we have this picture of him sitting up there. And it's a, it's a great shot if, if, you, if you wanna climb that high. So aside from the, the Petra, there are stone carvings all over the city of Petra. And you're literally at liberty to wander anywhere, which makes me wonder again, if at some point in time, some of them, I mean, I said you couldn't go inside the treasury, but some of these might be roped off in the future just because of the wear and tear on the stone. Um, for instance, in here, there were uh, benches, which it is assumed uh, people would recline at to have a meal, sort of like in the Roman way after, after a funeral. These are um, funerary monuments. There were um, tombs found in them. And so it's one after another, um, just for the eye to feast upon and to imagine and, and to read about as you move through here. There's also an amphitheater, uh, 4,000 spectators. And uh, um, again, just like uh, in, uh, in um, although the one in Amman was built during Roman times, this was built uh, prior to that, but the stones uh, carved uh, the seating for the, for the spectators. 
This is a structure called Qasr al Bint, the palace of the pharaoh's daughter, from a legend that the that supposedly the pharaoh's daughter had two suitors. And the 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 pharaoh said, "Whoever can uh, find a source of water first will win my daughter." What's interesting about this is that it didn't succumb. It's freestanding, obviously, and it didn't succumb to any earthquakes. But it is thought that perhaps the square shape of the building reduced the torsion uh, and the waves during the quake. And also, it has some elements of um, of string built inside the construction there. So this is uh, another, you, you do, I don't think you go inside that. I think we saw it from outside, but um, uh, goats. Also, also there had been um, Bedouins living in the caves in Petra, but when it became a world heritage site, they had to be evicted. So that was a point of, um, that was a sad, um, debate in Jordan, but they couldn't, they couldn't be there after it was named a UNESCO heritage site. Um, this is the Great Temple, which was actually excavated by Brown University, a team starting, I think, in 1993. So this could have been a religious or an administrative building. And again, um, just, a, just a massive, massive uh, uh, area. And um, the largest freestanding, or what was a freestanding building in Petra, and also with two massive water cisterns, you have to be able to conserve the water. That was the key to survival. But just a just a huge area there. And this is it's not a really good picture, but you can see they had the cisterns and they kept the cisterns underground because that would not make the water evaporate so quickly. And they had actually, um, they had quite a rich variety of agriculture just because they did master this, uh, this, um, this technique of harvesting the water from a nearby spring and using it to their advantage. So this great temple was uh, way up high above the street and towered over everything else. And uh, there are some souvenir sellers there. There's some cute little dolls being sold there or some um, uh, pieces of probably hand woven uh, cloth at the great temple. And then this would have been built by the Romans. This was a colonnaded street. This did succumb to um, the earthquake and Petra really started to even, it even thrived after the Romans took it over. But then uh, I think around 400 uh, AD, there were uh, just massive earthquakes. And also there were different trade routes that been established. A lot was being done by sea and it just, um, it was an empire and it just, just died out slowly but surely. But this, this uh, street was probably in Roman, good Roman fashion used for ceremonies or for commerce. Possibly there might have been stores in between these columns at one time. So we've seen a lot already. We saw the treasury. We saw the um, the um, the great temple. We saw Qasr al Bint, and then again off to the side, so many other smaller uh, um, cliffs with carvings into the cliff that you can look at. So if you've got the energy, you can climb, and this is sort of zigzag here. There are 800 steps leading up to what is called the monastery. And don't forget, you're about three miles away, and you have to, um, you are probably going to exit back through the visitor center, so you got to conserve your energy. And so this is the monastery. This is another example of that stone carving. Oh, and by the way, I should say, if you remember the treasury, and it had gods and it had a sort of um, Greek Roman motif. It's believed that possibly stone carvers were brought from Alexandria in Egypt to work on that. And so that had a little bit of a Western look to it. Whereas this is very, very plain. This is also an iconic building there and was probably used for a religious purpose. And then it's got a very flat level area in front of it, maybe for social gatherings. And once you're up there, you have this spectacular view. You've come up these 800 steps. So you are rewarded uh, for your efforts just with the valleys and the gorges and everything, everything around there. But these are the steps that you have to go up. So you do some, you see some people riding a little mule up. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. You do have to, you know, probably come back down. Um, but again, it's just all part of it, depending on your energy and how much time you have to spend there. So that's, that's this gorgeous, gorgeous uh, UNESCO heritage site. And when the vote was taken for the seven new or the seven wonders of the modern world, 
Petra was voted to be one of those of those wonders. Um, there is a little Petra, which you can hike to from the monastery. If you have the energy, it is recommended. It's sort of like it was a suburb for Petra and it's recommended that you have a guide just so you go in the right direction. And we made a stop there with the van. We didn't hike there and we liked this. Um, we liked this claim to fame where it says the best view in the world and you climbed up these steps and saw the best view in the world. And uh, so just a lot, just a lot to look at around there. And uh, um, again, always the um, the souvenirs, the the beautiful uh, tablecloths or tapestries, mini tapestries. There's a mobile. This is the um, the eye of the eye of Allah, and, and, and some keychains, keychains there. And uh, so I have to say that when Petra fell into ruin, it literally went into oblivion, and the world forgot about it. And then a a Swiss traveler, this man, I had said Jerusalem could be a whole nother talk. This man's life could be a whole nother talk, but he was Swiss and he wanted to travel to Africa and he went to great efforts to learn Arabic for about three or four years. And he dressed as wood so that he wouldn't stand out at all. And he had heard about this, uh, this place in the desert that sometimes the, 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 the desert dwellers would talk about or Somehow he heard about it. And so he became the first person to lay eyes on Petra in 1812 after it had slumbered literally for over a thousand years. And after that, things picked up again. And now, of course, it's, um, you know, it's the, like I said, the number one tourist attraction in the country. So he's just a fascinating character. And um, he is given credit for having, quote, rediscovered the, the lost city of, of Petra. So this, I just took a picture of her fun instead of Cleopatra, it's Cleopatra Hotel. And then uh, this was, this doesn't have anything special on it. I just like that they offer, we, we, they, we offer you home away from home. So these were two more, uh, two more hotels in the town. And uh, so we did not go to see Aqaba, the, the seaport um, down on the Red Sea and Jordan's uh, only, only port. Uh, we didn't have enough time for that, but um, we could, we could, Quasi imagine uh, Aqaba. But what we did want to do, and what I had mentioned previously, here we are leaving Petra, is to drive up along the Dead Sea coast here. And uh, we would be then at the world's lowest point. So we would be uh, 394 meters below sea level. So we did uh, drive up along that road. And um, it's a very curvy road heading over towards the Dead Sea. Um, built with um, EU funding, and then uh, an interesting table here showing. So we were, so you are here, and then just showing exactly how how you really are way, way, way down, way down before. I mean, below sea level. So the Dead Sea is um, deadly in a way. Um, uh, it's nine nine point six times saltier than the ocean, as I say at the top. Boats cannot sail in it. Fish cannot swim in it. Animals cannot survive around it. Okay, you see this herd of camels, but they're not going down to drink from the salt water. And you can easily, easily drown in the Dead Sea because if you take in just a couple of gulps of water, the electrolyte balance in your body is disturbed to such a point that you will stop functioning. So you want to, um, these, there are many, many resorts on both the Jordanian and the Israeli side because, uh, and so um, they have their own swimming pools and that's probably where you would spend most of your time. At the same time, however, the, um, the mud and the salt have very rich uh, mineral um, content for for your skin and for your hair and so there are a lot of cosmetic products made from you know here they're authentic maybe they're sold around the world who knows if they're real or not so there's some benefit to that but this picture that we always see this is also so iconic you're lying on your back in the dead sea reading the newspaper or here you have a group of people having fun but you spend a couple of minutes in there, but again, you don't wanna put your head in the water. You don't wanna risk um, swallowing any of the water. And then you would come back to your, to your, um, to your nice swimming pool after that. So, um, and then along the route, there were uh, tourist shops, uh, which will ship anything anywhere in the world. 
and uh, also the Dead Sea cosmetics were uh, readily available there. So we took an Arabic translation book with us, which we didn't need because again, English was ubiquitous. And we also had our little first aid kit that we always take and we didn't need any of that either. So it's nice to have it and not have to use it, but it's also very nice to have it, especially in a country where you're not exactly sure whether you could find something quickly. And once more back at Queen Alia Airport, um, just a beautiful display of sweets. You could take one home as a souvenir if you wish from the Zalatimo brothers. And so this is my um, presentation from ancient Amman to the deserts of Jordan. This is my uh, website, mariatravels.net, all over the world. And I, um, I hope you enjoyed it. And, I, um, and I'm happy that you took the time this evening and I'm open to questions. Thank you, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please put it down in the Q&A at the bottom. I did have a question. You said it was very cold in the desert. What do you think the temperature ballpark would have been? Well, I'm thinking it was about, um, about 45. That doesn't seem very cold, but it wasn't below freezing, but maybe 40, 45. It's just uh, once the sun goes behind the, the, um, the uh, you know, and you're, you're not in, the, you're not in the sun anymore. It, it did, it did get cold. So 40 ish right around there. Well, and, and what would the temperature be during the day then? During the day, it was about 65 or maybe up to 70. I was really thankful in retrospect that we were there in December. I wouldn't really want to be there in the middle of summer. Um, in the middle of summer, what would it be? I, you know, I didn't look that up, but it will be uh, considerably, considerably hotter. And you'd be drinking a lot, a lot more water, water. Uh, especially walking through all those trails at, at Petra and... Uh, yeah. Um, somebody just made a nice comment. That was wonderful. Thank you. Again, do you have any other questions? Um, how's the safety there? How did you feel about safety? We felt we felt very safe. We didn't ever have any um, uh, uh, feelings not. And we have an older daughter who runs everywhere where she goes and who just took off through the city of Amman and 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 uh, um, which is kind of tricky because the sidewalks in Amman can be a little bit crumbling. So safety as far as twisting an ankle, but as far as personal safety, we had no uh, second thoughts about that at all. What, uh, what year did you go? We went in December of 2018, so almost three years ago. Mm -hmm. so, fairly, so fairly recently. Yeah. Um, if uh, someone were to visit, how long would you recommend they spend there? Well, how much time do you think would be good? Well, we were there for a week. I mean, if you really want, I mean, if I had had two more days at the end, I would have gone to one of those Dead Sea resorts, but certainly in a week, you can see a great deal. And, and uh, I mean, if you had the time and the luxury of time, maybe, uh, you know, down to Aqaba or um, uh, it, I'd say, I'd say seven or eight days is a, is a good amount of time. 10 days would give you time to see maybe Umayyad palaces out in the desert and, uh, couple more things that we didn't but but uh, you could do it you can do a lot in a week a lot and then you can cross into Israel now which you couldn't years ago and so if you wanted to combine it that's possible also okay someone asked did you have all your travel plans made by one agency or how did you how did you do your um, at your uh, trip so my husband really likes to research the internet. So we made all of our plans ourselves. We we did, but there are certainly many many travel agencies that will uh, will help you out and do everything for you. But it's just his way that um, he researches the trips ahead of time. And and uh, and again, it was just it was just amazingly easy. The Airbnb in Amman, um, the, the the Airbnb um, owner in Amman arranged the van for us. Uh, the Royal Jordanian flights were easy to book, and then the um, the booking booking the uh, the desert stay and choosing, you know, what we wanted to do during the day. Uh, we we um, yeah. I mean, it takes time, but we we did it we did it ourselves in in our case. But you can get a package deal and just you know be free of worry of all of that and just go and have an equally successful visit. I think anyway. Um, um, someone asked, could you visit the home of King Hussein and Queen Noor? Is, is there 
any of their homes open or not? Not to my knowledge. The royal palaces are all in use, and I don't believe any of them are open to the public. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. um, so Troy Public Library has Lonely Planet Jordan book. So if you're interested, um, you can always put that on hold and uh, get that checked out. But uh, yeah, that was very interesting. Let's see if we have any other questions. Um, and you mentioned that you really enjoyed going around December because it was a little cooler. Uh, someone asked what time of the year would you recommend? Well, we chose December just because um, our family logistics make it easy for everyone to get together at Christmas time. But, um, but uh, I, I have a friend who went in, in the month of May and now I know some people who have booked a tour for October. Again, I probably would avoid uh, June, July, August, just because it is a desert country. Um, so those shoulder shoulder months, uh, and again, December was advantageous to us for family reasons. But it wasn't. Um, it was it was very comfortable. It wasn't a problem at all. Um, so, so just not, just not the summer, I would say. Yeah, that that's probably a good idea. Um, yeah. um, how did you travel around the country? Did you rent a car or have a tour company? What did you, how did you get we, around? We had rented a van for our family, but it's very easy to, um, to ride the bus if you want to. And I'm, um, I'm probably, the tour companies probably have buses or vans for, um, for you if you're in a group, but we did meet, especially at, um, in Wadi Rum in the youth hostel setting, a lot of, um, younger people who were traveling by bus around the country. And I didn't, but I have traveled around Israel um, alone in a bus. And so, you know, it's so much more prevalent in different parts of the world as opposed to where we live here and so much, so much easier. So, uh, so we had a van, but again, um, the buses are, um, are, uh, are fine, are fine. It might take a little bit longer, but that's okay, so. Uh, any other questions? Um, would you go back or, or which, where's the next place you're going to go? <laughs> well, I would always go back. The only reason I wouldn't go back is because I probably have a, so many, so many lists of so many long other things that like we talked about before the talk started. And, uh, um, but um, yeah, it was great. It was, it was, um, it was, a, it was just a wonderful trip and it was uh, just, especially well just everything the antiquities and petra and and uh, uh it's it's a country that earns in a, it, its status as far as being a tourist de destination you can see why they pull in uh the money that they do why it's 14 percent of their gdp they just have a lot to show and a lot to share and it's it's hospitable to travelers also mm -hmm. oh well, uh, well, thank you, uh, Maria. I don't see any other questions. Um, that was real interesting. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you again some thank other time. You. Well, thank you for um, having me. Thank you All to right. everyone this evening also. Thanks. All right. Uh, again, I um, want to thank the Friends of the Library uh, for supporting us. And when you leave, please fill out the surveys because that's always very helpful for us. Um, and keep checking out our, um, our calendar because um, we got a lot of things coming down the tube then on Zoom. Thanks again and uh, have a safe uh, night and enjoy. Oh, any shots to visit Jordan? Did you have to have any shots? No, we didn't feel like we needed. I mean, we have, you know, the regular vaccinations for travel, but we weren't um, advised that we needed anything special. Having said that, we are an unusual family having been foreign service. So we have a lot of shots, like even hepatitis A that maybe people might not always have, but it's always good to check the country. We didn't, we didn't check and we didn't get anything special. No, there's nothing like, uh, for instance, uh, malaria or, um, or uh, you know, if you were to travel in Africa or, or if you were to travel to India, there wasn't anything like that, anything special that we had to take into consideration. No. So. Okay, well, thanks again and everyone have a great night. Yeah, thank you, Maggie, thanks. All right, thank you.